Sustainable Herbs Program Toolkit webinar series. As you enter into the Zoom room, please take a moment and introduce yourself in the chat. You can let us know where you're from and what, if you work in the botanical industry, what, what your work is. And at the end, we'll have some time, hopefully for questions. If you have a question, please enter them in the Q&A, not the chat. And if we can't uh, cover all the questions during the webinar, we'll save them and I can share them with the panelists and hopefully they can get back to you. And again, as you introduce, if you introduce yourself in the chat, please make sure to share to everyone and not just the panelists. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get started. Again, welcome to this webinar. Today, I'm really excited for the topic today. We'll be talking about certifications as a path to sustainability. And I'll talk a little bit about more about that in a moment. This, as I've said before, this is part of a, a series of webinars we're having really focusing on tools for implementing sustainability in, in the botanical industry, mostly really around responsible sourcing. And we'll be following this webinar today with one on May 20th that's co-hosted with the Fair Wild Foundation. And that's really taking the issues and ideas of this conversation today to the next level to look more specifically at mutually beneficial trade partnerships, especially around wild harvested plants. And we're also concurrently having another webinar series around ethnobotany. And I'm very much looking forward to this conversation on June 3rd with anthropologist John Rashford on decolonizing ethno, ethno sorry, I can't see the word, ethnobotany. And that information and registration information is available on the American Botanical Council and Sustainable Herbs Program websites. And all of these webinars are made available for free through the generous support of our underwriters you can see this list here and you can find all this information also on the Sustainable Herbs Program website. And they're also made available by the support of the American Botanical Council members. You can find out more information about American Botanical Council and how to become a member at herbalgram.org. And so with that introduction, I really, I wanna to turn to the speakers today and the topic which has been a long time coming. A number of us have been talking about how to really bring conversations about equity and living income into how botanicals are sourced from around the world. And the topic today is really looking at the role of certifications as a pathway to do that, both how it can help accomplish that and the limits of certifications. And I'm thrilled for this, these speakers that we have today. And I'll introduce them now and then turn it over to each person. Um, Jan von Enden is head of group sustainability and supply chains at the Martin Bauer Group. He has a background in tropical agriculture and he spent most of his career in coffee producing countries. He joined the botanical sector recently and he's now dedicated to applying his experience in a new setting. Secondly, and I hope I'll pronounce your name correctly, Yuka Vartz from Weingarten University. She holds an MSc in agriculture and environmental economics. And she's, after completing her degree, she worked in an NGO focusing on rural economic development while conserving or enhancing biodiversity. She works at Weingarten University and research since 2008 as a senior researcher and project manager for sustainable value chain development. And Kevin Casey, grew up in Southern California and studied philosophy and business at the University of San Diego. He attended the Ayurvedic Institute where he studied with Dr. Vincent, Vincent La Vassant Ladd and later worked on the staff in their herbal pharmacy before going on to start Banyan Botanicals with Scott Kate in 1996. So welcome all three of you. And I am really looking forward to the different perspectives that you each bring 
And Yuka, I'll ask you to begin. And we'll... Thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm from the University of Wageningen in Holland, which is very difficult to pronounce, but uh, I hope you all know it. And uh, if you have any questions after the discussions or after today, please feel, do not hesitate to contact me uh, on the topic of which I will be speaking. So Anne, you have the first slide, I think. So I will be speaking today about the research we've done in tea, cocoa, uh, and also coffee and other um, commodity sectors specifically on certification, but also on other uh, types of interventions to improve smallholder farmer incomes and also wage worker incomes. Uh, and a little bit on uh, wild harvesting and roibles as well. Um, maybe you can already move to the next slide. Um, the main topic of introduction today or of discussion uh, uh, for the angle today is a living income concept, uh, which has been quite recently developed by a group of NGOs and uh, governments, and also a lot of companies have been involved, um, because uh, they saw the need of going beyond a World Bank poverty line, which is basically about mere subsistence. Uh, and actually what uh, a lot of people in organizations would like to see is that people uh, have the chance to earn a decent standard of living, so have a decent income. So the living income concept has been developed. Uh, it's connected to the living wage concept where people uh, who are employed, for instance, by a plantation also have the chance to earn a decent income from their employment. So as you can see here, uh, the living income concept is based on having uh, a food for a model diet. So you should have a nutrition, nutritious diet. Uh, you should be able to have a decent housing uh, and you should be able to buy other essential needs such as clothing for travels uh, and make sure that your children can go to school and also have a margin for unforeseen events such as healthcare and uh, well, uh, if, if there's for instance a, a, a shock uh, or a crisis in terms of drought. Uh, and the idea behind this, this concept is also to make the livelihoods concept a little bit more tangible, right? So, so that's why I say it, it's a tangible aspect because livelihoods for a lot of people is, uh, is a bit untangible because it's about assets. I mean, it's human capacity, it's natural assets, it's financial assets. Uh, and this concept is uh, obviously doesn't uh, contain all, all of those assets in terms of livelihoods, but at least it's a tangible way of looking at how people are doing uh, and also how to measure how they are doing uh, and to see what needs to be done for them in order to improve on their income. Um, we've applied this concept to several studies, uh, several data sets we had in COCO and tea specifically, which I will be present presenting. On the next slide, please, Anne. And here you can see on the left hand figure, uh, this is data from people who have been in the interventions such as certification uh, in the cocoa and in the tea sector. So to the left, you see a case from Ghana uh, in the cocoa sector. In the middle, it's Ivory Coast from the cocoa sector. And to the right is uh, the tea smallholder farmers in Kenya. And there you can see only very small number of farmers is earning more than the living income. Uh, and even we, we, know, we knew that well, things could improve, but this was actually quite a shock to us. The, the proportion of farmers is simply very small. And we also find uh, even uh, while certification is, is, is useful, uh, it, uh, farmers benefit from certification, um, the benefits are not large enough for, for them to earn a living income. So what we see is a maximum of about 30% income increase uh, from any intervention in household income. Well, actually, sometimes 200% or even 300% of income increase is required for farmers to earn a living income. And um, the dynamics we see there also apply to workers, for instance, supply chains with a lot of workers and also for people harvesting in the wild. So we, we find four root causes for the fact that these farmers are, so many farmers are so poor. Uh, for instance, small farm sizes. If you have a very tiny, tiny farm in, in Kenya, for instance, it's 0 0.1 hectare. So most farmers have 0 0.1 hectare. They simply cannot earn a sufficient income um, to, earn a to, to earn a living income uh, because of the, those conditions. Furthermore, yields are generally very low. Um, so this could be improved, but, but 
based on the, sort of the current volumes they produce, it's very difficult for them to earn a, a better income. Then there is a very limited opportunity for people to earn income from other sources, such as from, for instance, horticultural crops or employment or a business. Uh, so that's rather limited in these cases. And finally, there's the whole discussion on prices. So are prices actually remunerative? Should they increase? Shouldn't they? Maybe they shouldn't. Uh, but also the stability of prices. So in the cocoa sector, there's a huge drop in the price at the moment. Uh, and that will be having a huge impact on, uh, on farmer incomes. Um, so, but these same types of causes we see in, in sort of other dynamics, such as, for instance, the wage workers in tea in Kenya uh, and in uh, Malawi, for instance, where simply the conditions in which the tea production takes place and how the supply chain works are not beneficial uh, to pay out better wages to the uh, plantation workers, right? So if we can move to the next slide, one of the things in this aspect is uh, the social inclusion part. We see this, this data is uh, about certified farmers, right? So even we see uh, worse figures for farmers who are not certified. And what we see there is that uh, it is, it's relatively easy to, or well, it's, it's easier to work with farmers who are already certified, who are performing relatively well, right? And to improve their situations. But there's a large group of farmers in cocoa and tea and the same in coffee, where for whom it's very difficult to uh, improve their situation. So our uh, finding is a, is a bit of a difficult one. Uh, uh, but it shouldn't hamper us to, to work together to, to find solutions in this, is that we see that a lot of the contextual factors and structural factors influence the fact whether people can earn a sufficient income, a decent income. Uh, for instance, farm size is, is a really important one in tea and also in cocoa. Um, and what we see is one third of the, these cocoa and tea farmers are likely to have the potential to earn a living income in the short or medium term. But that means that without structural change on different sides, uh, the two thirds will not be able to earn a living income, uh, also not in the long term. So that's quite an, a lesson learned for us, um, also for us as researchers being involved in this study. So you can uh, click a few times because then it adds uh, some numbers. So what we see is farmer support can be tailored or should be tailored, actually. Certification often is sort of a one size fits all program, uh, which makes a lot of sense for some certain quality standards, uh, certain training needs, etc. Uh, but to really make a difference, you need to tailor far uh, uh, farmer support, also taking into account uh, personal factors of the farmer and his family. You should address uh, land fragmentation uh, because uh, farm sizes are generally getting smaller everywhere because of inheritance structures. Uh, so that's something you should take into account in any uh, measures. On-farm diversification and off-farm employment opportunities are really important. It's not something that can be easily done. So there needs to be, uh, especially for on-farm diversification, you need um, uh, a labor market and a market structure. We'll click, please click one time uh, again, a market structure. And uh, there's also the issue of price and whether prices can be increased. And if so, uh, in cocoa and tea, for instance, uh, these are huge sort of global liberalized markets. With price increase, a lot of farmers will be trying to improve their yields, which will unbalance supply and demand and the price will drop enormously, what we see now in, happening in cocoa. So these are lessons learned uh, from our research. Um, and especially, especially if you could move to the next slide, uh, we see that there are some farmers uh, in the green uh, box who actually have a potential to earn a living income based on sort of their current conditions. They have enough money to invest. They have large enough farm sizes. They can grow uh, in improve their yields. Um, these farmers are relevant generally the most targeted farmers because they, uh, they, it, it's most logical sense for the buyers to actually work with these farmers and improve their situation. The large group of farmers to the right, they don't have a potential to earn a living income. And we see them generally uh, either not participating because they can't, but also they don't have the chance uh, because they cannot invest. Uh, they do not have the farm size uh, to, 
to be able to sort of grow their income. Um, so this is a group of farmers where you actually have to need to do structural change or structural uh, support. Uh, focus on food security, but also, for instance, look at safety nets, for instance. So is there a possibility that farmers can uh, earn an income? If they can't earn an income with other employment, for instance, or diversification, what do you do as a government? Um, and what we found as, as one of an overall um, a conclusion is really to talk to the farmers and workers community members on how things could improve. We see a big gap in terms of uh, we don't sometimes we don't really know what people actually want to do in the future, right? Um, and look at what the possibilities are in their area uh, for improvement. So zoom out a little bit to see the bigger picture of their uh, their situation. Um, and with that, you can uh, develop better and also more efficient interventions. Uh, and find, well, that's because of the structural change aspect, you need uh, collaboration between public sectors, private sector, but also the cooperatives. You Basically, what we find is that not one party can solve it all. Um, so, and that's why we'd like to contribute to with our university as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the framing of the larger context and understanding the complexity, but also the way you share it, that there is a path forward to, to do something about it. And, and I feel like it's a really great framing, Kevin, for, for you to talk some about as a company that's really invested in becoming B Corp certified, which is also taking a whole approach of the whole system, as well as more supply chain um, certifications like Fair Wild and now your work with Fair for Life. So I'd love to hear you talk some about your vision and the approach you've taken. Uh, yeah, thank you, Anne. So um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about third-party certifications and um, how they can be used as tools for addressing socio and economic challenges. We found it to be super helpful, both working with B Corp and Fair for Life in terms of helping us set goals and be accountable and, and make progress. So um, yeah, so just to, to set a little bit of the stage, um, a little bit about Banyan Botanicals, where um, we consider ourselves to be an Ayurvedic lifestyle company. So we are supplying herbs and herbal products to our customers, but for those that are interested, we're also um, seeking to share Ayurvedic wisdom with them and uh, educate, inspire, motivate um, and it help them embody an, an, an Ayurvedic lifestyle. And so when we think about health from an Ayurvedic perspective, um, it's really centered on achieving a, a greater sense of inner harmony and balance, both within and externally in one's environment. And so just by our very nature of, of our business and what we're trying to do, we're oriented towards serving our customers, but we're also very conscious of holding the intention to be good environmental stewards um, and also to be in right relationship um, within the communities that we participate in and then also um, in the relationships that we have in, in our supply chain. So when we first learned about B Corp, um, it definitely caught our attention and, um, and we thought that it could be a useful tool and we're like, we definitely have to do this someday. Um, and just looking at other companies that chose to be B Corps, um, you know, I think Patagonia was one of the first, um, and then within our industry, um, companies that we really look up to like Herb Farm um, and Pucka, um, it, it was inspiring to see the work that they're doing. And so, you know, I will say that like, we would take a look at their, their social and environmentally responsible reporting that they would do each year and, and look at the projects and, it was a little bit intimidating because you'd see this just this awesome, inspiring projects. And we'd be, you know, as a relatively small company being like, wow, do we, we really have the resources and expertise to do something like that? Maybe we should wait until um, we're a little bit bigger. And so um, we, we kind of kicked the can down the road a little bit. And then um, a, a couple years ago, um, our social environmental responsibility manager, a wonderful woman by the name of Aaron Douglas, came to me and she was just like, hey, I don't think we should wait any longer. Um, it's not about perfection. It's, it's about making progress. 
And that really resonated with my heart. And um, we were able to get our leadership team on board. And basically we, we took the leap and um, just get kind of set about the work of, of, of what it takes to, to become a B Corp and to get involved with that community. And so um, <clears throat> I will say that there was lots of challenges along the way. Um, I, I'd say first and foremost is just having the resources and, and namely time. Um, the B Corp assessment itself is, is close to 200 questions and, and they're not simple questions. They're like full on projects to like figure out what, what the answers are. So you're like pulling reports and, and, and doing research just to kind of uh, see where you are. And so working through the assessment actually took us many, many months to, to complete. Um, but, you know, it's definitely a useful process. But, but, but definitely took some time to do that. Um, another challenge is um, balancing stakeholder interests. So like as we, as we got into the process, we realized that there was just so many things that, that we wanted to be able to do, whether it was for our employees, where you're uh, looking at um, improving benefits such as like health insurance or retirement program. Or, or just doing an assessment and making sure that, that, that everybody is, is earning a living wage um, and recognizing that each one of those things takes, takes, you know, takes money, right? And also wanting to be involved in our uh, communities in a philanthropic way. And then what we're talking about today too, do, um, being more connected uh, within the supply chain and wanting to make a difference in helping to raise the, the standard of living. Um, for the people that are actually doing the, the works out, out in the field. And so, you know, you're looking at all of this and, and, and realizing like, you know, it, take, it takes a fair amount of money. And at the same time, we have to, to stay focused on our core business and turn a profit and make sure that, that we continue on and we're being financially responsible. And so, so that's a challenge. And I would say that that's an ongoing discussion in the sense of like, how much do we want to cut into profitability to achieve our social and environmental responsibility goals, right? And it's a, it's a constant like looking at that um, and, and, and keeping things in balance um, so that, you know, that we can continue on and do the work that, that, that we're here to do. So. Um, and then another challenge that I would call out is um, just engagement of the team. And, and by that, I don't mean like that the team wouldn't be, wasn't interested in social and environmental responsibility. We very much have a group of people that are committed to that. It was more of a bandwidth issues because I'm sure as everybody can relate, like, um, you know, a, a growing business, everybody has lots of responsibilities already and are relatively busy. And then all of a sudden we're like, hey, we need you to pull this report or we need you to monitor this or we need to, your help to, to do this initiative. And just really having to look at things uh, in, in a way where we're adjusting allocation of, of their time and priorities so that we could fit in the, the, the different initiatives that we wanted to make, make space for. So. Um, so those are a few of the, of the challenges, um, but I would say that, that um, despite those challenges, there's just been amazing benefits um, with both B Corp and Fair for Life. Um, it, a couple of the main ones are um, just having third party accountability, uh, you know, to have a resource that's in a sense kind of looking over your shoulder, coaching you um, and setting deadlines, right? There's nothing like a, an on-site audit to, to, to really like facilitate discussions happening, decisions being made, and then, and then uh, you know, focusing on completing projects uh, ahead of deadlines so that you feel like you're making progress. And so in our case, um, where that was useful, it's like, you, you know, you, you have your values and they're written on a piece of paper or they're on the wall and you have these high ideals, but like the, the actually like, embodying those and, and, and doing effective things like that we definitely found this helped to get things off of our dream list and actually um, put them into to a place where we could we could manifest them and so that was that was hugely helpful. Um, another benefit is um, the resources that, that both B Corp and Fair for Life provide. They're both um, pretty hands-on and provide you know great information. The, the assessment that I was referring to along with each of the questions they would provide um, information on what other companies were doing to, to kind of be like um, like best practices like, in what they were doing to, to earn points, but more importantly, to, to make a difference in the different categories. 
And so we found that to be educational, inspiring, get our creative juices going of like, okay, how can we apply what they're doing to our business? Um, and so that's super helpful. Um, and then uh, it, it, another resource is the actual, like in the case of B Corp, the, the community that it connects you with, like the, being in contact with other B Corp companies, right? And being able to share and learn from experiences of companies that might be like a little bit ahead of us or way ahead of us. Um, so, you know, things like uh, measuring your carbon footprint, like talking to companies that have already done that, right? And, and being like, okay, what did, you know, how did you navigate that? How did you go about it? Um, and we found that to, to, to be super helpful to be connected to, to what, what, what B Corp calls the, the beehive uh, and learn in that way. So I could go on, on. there's, I mean, so many benefits, but just rallying off just, just a couple, like it's been super um, <clears throat> rewarding to our team to, to, to be a B Corp, but not, not just like, okay, we're a B Corp, but, but also just the feeling of doing good work and, and, and knowing that, that we're making an effort to uh, address our, our social and environmental responsibilities and that they're playing a role in, in making that happen. Um, and then I would also say that from a customer perspective, especially like our core customers, the people that really resonate with our brand and are paying attention to what we're doing, that, um, that they appreciate that, the efforts that, that we're making um, and, and able to, to share with them. So, so that's a benefit. And the, the biggest benefit of all is, is actually just being able to do the work, right? Like um, one of B Corp's, I guess their slogan is, you know, using business as a force of good. And, it, and obviously that it, it feels good to, to not just be doing your, your, your core work, but to, to be, um, you know, hopefully being a better environmental steward and, and, and that um, and, and more, more responsible as well. So, um, yeah, so I, I overall, I would just say that, that we found uh, working and engaging with those two organizations to be a huge benefit and it was worth like taking that leap. Um, and I would say that, you know, we're still, we feel like we're, we're very much at the beginning of the process. Like we did achieve our B Corp certification a little while back, but they're constantly raising the bar as to what you need to do to recertify. And, and it really is just kind of like, okay, all right, now we need to like, they're, they're really pushing companies to measure their carbon footprint um and, and things like that so it, it things that we might again like have put off it's just like kind of forcing us to to to, to do that and, and same thing i guess i'll just throw in there since we're talking about supply chain today um fair for life um it, it has been super useful and challenging in, in, in that um there, there's a lot to it um and, and and lots of things that they require that are pushing us to really deepen our relationship with our suppliers. And we've already held that as, as a core value in terms of like wanting to build deep long-term relationships, but they're really pushing us to, to go more and more direct to the actual producers of the herbs and to, as much as possible to um, minimize the, the middle companies in, in the way. So, so that, um, that we're actually more aware of what's actually happening on the ground instead of relying on several layers to, to convey to us what, what it is. And that, that, that's, that's, that's a challenge for us because um, it takes more re resources, it takes more time, um, but at the same time, it's something that we're excited about, but, but really feel like we're, we're just, you know, beginning to kind of roll up our sleeves and, and, and learn about that. And I did a little reading on, on Jan's work uh, from his blog uh, before and just talking about facing the truth. Um, and just really wanting to understand what the actual situation is so that we can work with others to uh, um, hopefully collaborate and, uh, and, and, and make improvements. So. Great, thank you so much, Kevin. And of course, we could, I could ask lots more about that. And I wanna bring in Jan's voice, which I forgot to mention in my introduction before coming to the botanical industry, Jan worked for many years in the coffee sector and which has a different history and experience and with certifications and so welcome Jan. Thank you. Thank you Anne. Yeah and, and, and thank you Kevin and, and Yuka. Super interesting and inspiring um, presentations. Um, I will also sh start sharing my screen now. I hope that all works. I hope you can see my screen now. Yes. 
my phone. I just have to get it to full screen. Oops. Okay. Yeah, thank, thanks for the introduction, Anne. And, and the disclaimer actually was very important because uh, um, I'm relatively new to the botanical sector. Uh, I've been working many years uh, in coffee, very deep, also in communities uh, down the supply chain, um, but also in, in connection and collaboration with, uh, with large corporations in, uh, in coffee. But um, yeah, everything I will, I will say today, you, um, you know, a lot of, of that, what I'm, I'm talking today is, is about my experience from coffee, trying to um, transfer that, um, that, that to the botanical sector and maybe also share some learnings, which in certifications, I made some not so good experiences uh, in coffee and maybe just as a little warning sign uh, um, um, to, to avoid these mistakes, which were done in the coffee sector partly. Um, but before jumping into my presentation, um, a few words on sustainability and Martin Bauer. <clears throat> sustainability is an absolute key concept for a company like, uh, like Martin Bauer, because we are working uh, every day with basically thousands of farmers and wild collectors all over the world uh, who are producing and collecting the products we, we then um, buy and process and sell to our customers. And um, if we don't make sure that the communities and the people and the environment from which we source is okay or even better than okay and um, then we will not have a future uh, business case and we will we will be having a lot of problems and struggles to to source our high quality products um, so this is the kind of the business case to sustainability for us which is always important but um, also very important is that we are a family-owned company um, which has strong values uh, about sustainability pushing us forward uh, to do the right thing, which I think is also very important. Sustainability has a business case, but I think uh, it's, it's, it has also a very important ethical um, component to it. Um, one key concept, and I will talk a little bit more about that during, during my presentation, which Martin Bauer implements is the, is the Marba Grown. Uh, Marba Grown is, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I explain a little bit further uh, and later on, it is more a sourcing concept rather than, than a standard, so it's a little bit different to that, but it has been a process over the ten, past 10 years, so everything I'm talking about today has been developed by, by the experts of, of Martin Bauer over many years uh, through many, many trips to origin, so um, I, I'm only here presenting all the good work which has been done already in the past. But before kind of jumping deeper into, into the um, aspects and, and concepts of certification, um, yeah, I'm not going to start with a boring definition of what is sustainability, like the Brundtland uh, uh, definition. Um, I try to make it a little bit more tangible. So first of all, sustainability is complex. And I thought sustainability is complex when I was working in coffee. And now I'm working uh, at Martin Bauer and see that there are 200 different products from I don't know how many countries. So it's even more complex. Sustainability in the botanical sector is really complex. Then sustainability also very much depends on the perspective. If you walk into a room uh, and ask 10 different people how they would define sustainability, you probably would get 10 different answers. And very important to me, sustainability is not always pretty. Because when you talk about sustainability, you also talk about the things which are not sustainable. And when you, when you work uh, in, in tropical supply chains uh, and uh, yeah, there, there is poverty. And as Yuka mentioned, there are very small farmers who, who struggle to make a living on their farms. So this is a reality um, which is not pretty, but I think we have to face as well when we, when we talk about sustainability because these are the things we want to improve over time. Certification standard labels, uh, Kevin mentioned already B Corp. Uh, um, he was talking about Fair for Life and Fair Wild. So I think there's a lot of um, good work around and implemented in, in, the, in, the, in the sector. And the main, for me, always the main uh, benefit of, of certification standards and labels is that they reduce complexity. I said before, sustainability is so complicated and we really need somebody to help us to define what it is. Of course, then you've got, as I said also before, very different viewpoints on what sustainability is. 
fair trade is much more socially orientated, USD, uh, USDA organic, much more agriculture orientated. B Corp is a totally different animal because it looks at, at entire companies. And Marba Ground, for example, is more a sourcing concept which contains a standard at its core. So very different, um, very different approaches, but uh, in the end, all want the same. All want to want to strive for sustainability. All want to reach uh, better conditions on the ground, on uh, on the farm, and for the for the farmers. The big question is now: Is that scalable? Is sustainability is it scalable? Are certification schemes scalable? Uh, and how far are they scaled uh, are scalable? And what real what really delivers the positive change and impact on the ground? I think this is just probably the most difficult question to ask. And I haven't seen one sector who actually scales sustainability. It is such a difficult and such a hard work and long-term work. Um, and there's definitely not, not a silver bullet to it, also as Yuka mentioned in her presentation. Um, and here my, my old history from, uh, from coffee and cocoa comes in. Just, um, you might wanna have a look at it later, but it's, I found it very interesting how different large companies approach uh, um, sustainability in other sectors. Mondelez, uh, a large cocoa um, company, you might know Oreo cookies. So they're, for example, from them, they approach sustainability without any certification at all. They are looking at working in communities, measuring impact, and this is how they push forward um, sustainability. Pete's Coffee, you see at the left quite a number of different um, approaches. They do direct trade, they do certification, they do um, impact work with a number of different partners. So there you already see that it's probably wise to approach sustainability um, from different angles. And now I'm, I would like to dive a little bit deeper into, uh, into some experience I made in coffee. And on the right hand side, um, this is these are actually coffee cherries. So they are not rose hip. You might confuse that. So just to be very clear about that. So what happened in the coffee sector and what was pushing sustainability there? Um, it all started with a very, very strong and controversial um, report in 2002 uh, by, Ox, by Oxfam. And they are they basically pointing fingers on the industry, on the big coffee roasters. And, and telling them that they have to do more, that uh, prices are too low, farmers are suffering. And that was in the media and a big, big thing. So, and what, what happened then? How, the, how did the industry react? They did um, like very logical and very pragmatic. They set themselves very, very ambitious goals in terms of how many um, percent of their supply chain they want to get certified. Um, I was super happy at that time. Um, I thought, wow, now sustainability is going to be mainstreamed. Uh, um, investments will be flowing into the coffee growing communities uh, in order to achieve these, um, the, the, these goals and certifications, um, which definitely happened. But there were also some, some problems which I would like to, to share with you. Um, first of all, what, what happened? Uh, these huge demands on certified coffee led to an extreme competition between the labels. So all the different labels uh, were basically approaching the, the large companies and making promises that they could fulfill their, uh, their very ambitious uh, goals. Um, but in the end, uh, um, they, it was a very, very difficult task to, to reach more and more farmers. So what happened, and this is also scientifically, um, you, you can read that studies about that, um, unfortunately, these standards, in order to capture more market share, they were becoming less strict. So um, they, they, are, they are loosening up, they are, they are reducing their, um, their, their standards in order to capture more quantity. And then the other uh, side, you also um, had uh, auditors um, that, that are becoming less strict to win more clients and certify more coffee. So basically, this huge push for sustainability, for sustainable, sustainably certified coffee um, ended up um, to some extent to um, to a race to the bottom, and actually, yeah, not 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 necessary to the better. So that we should always look out um, when there are too big of uh, demands for certified coffee. The next point, which was always a, a big concern of mine, um, first of all, uh, certification went for the for the big uh, for the big farms and the very very advanced um, cooperatives. 
Um, but the neediest farmers, they didn't, they didn't get any benefit from it because it's too expensive to lift them into a very high um, demanding uh, certification. So they are basically uh, um, left out. And there's one figure which I always quote and find quite, quite amazing that um, around 80% uh, of the world's certified coffee, sustainable certified coffee uh, is produced only by 3% of the farmers. So there's, uh, there you can see that the, um, the sustainable coffee is coming to a large, large extent from, from large farms and not necessarily from small farmers. And last but not least, uh, um, the industry was set a goal and the goal was getting the label. Uh, the impact and, and the, the change they, uh, um, they were generating and hoping to generate wasn't really looked at too much because the, um, the coffee buyers, they had uh, um, orders from their bosses to buy certified coffee. And this is the only thing they were interested in. So not, not too many people asked really about the, about the impact on the ground. So I think these three points are very important to keep in mind uh, um, when certification is growing so that we are not falling into, this, into these traps. Um, so the big question now, so what, what, what can we do? And this also brings me, uh, brings me back to, to Marva Ground. When I joined Martin Bauer, um, uh, I, I came with that experience from coffee and I thought, how can we, how can we overcome that? And I think uh, it really demands a, a very dedicated and kind of yeah, more detailed look at how to achieve sustainability. And what I found is that these six points um, I'm going to go through now uh, actually in the heart of what is Marba Ground. So first of all, accept the journey. Sustainability is a journey and it can be long and difficult. So it's not that you go into an origin and everything is going to be nice and great. It takes time to lift people and companies and conditions uh, up. It takes time and investment. Um, for the second point, also very important, honest and trustful partnerships. You need to accept that there are challenges and very often, and that also happening to me and, uh, and us as a company even, don't exclude suppliers for being honest. So if they are telling you, look, I mean, we might have problems here with deforestation or, um, or people struggle to earn a living income, you know, don't exclude them because they're not meeting the requirements, but look for solutions there together. The third point, it's really about the people. So we also in coffee, we, we talked a lot about the plant, about quality, about pests and diseases, biodiversity. But in the end, and I was very clear about that um, when I lived in the communities, it's really about the people who plant, grow, collect and protect uh, and the environment. So involve them closely. And Yuka mentioned that before, it's so important to get the perspective of, of the local people. Where, where do they think they wanna go and what are the solutions there? Direct support, I think it's another very important aspect. Um, a standard uh, and a certification can cover a lot, but the, it cannot definitely cannot um, cover everything. So there is important uh, work to do in health, in education, in looking, giving young people perspectives in rural areas that they're not migrate. So very important also be going beyond the, the certification. Setting goals and, and in particular impact goals, I think that's a very important aspect. Um, not just uh, kind of looking at how many percent we can we can certify by certified products, but really looking at what change can you uh, um, deliver on the ground with the communities you work with. And last but not least, and that's a really difficult one, and I'm super happy what what Kevin just said is that B Corp is pushing him every year to to get uh, uh, yeah to to get more demanding. Um, you know, to keep the standard high. Um, it's really important to, to uh, yeah, not give in to lowering standards uh, just because you want to catch more market share, for example. And last but not least, reward the, reward the success. That can be a certification. For example, we, within Marba Grown, uh, we have an equality um, agreement with um, Woods Certified and Rainforest. So you can gain a, um, a certificate, which is obviously great but it's also um, a cost topic, right? I mean, the, all the points I mentioned before, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a journey and uh, and also includes a lot of costs. Um, we have a big sustainability team. Uh, there's, uh, you know, dedicated people in our sourcing department. We have a dedicated uh, auditing department. So it's all uh, costs uh, in terms of, um, yeah, reaching, um, reaching certain standards and reaching for us all, 
uh, a long-term sustainable um, supply of, of our products. So I hope I could give you a little useful insight of what's happening in, uh, in coffee. Maybe some things can be transferred also to the botanical sector. And, and don't get me wrong, I don't want to sound pessimistic. Uh, um, I just want to warn a little bit about the potential pitfalls uh, one can fall into. Thank you, Jan, and thank all of you. I, there's a few questions in the chat before turning to that. I kind of wanted to follow up, Yuka, and ask you to reflect on what you've heard, but maybe specifically from what I've read about the limits and challenges of certification, there's a lot people talk about. There are certain conditions that can make that kind of certification more successful. You know, I found that number, Jan, that you gave about 80% of coffee was from 3% of the farms. A disturbing and surprising. I didn't realize it was that bad. So you could love to hear if you can talk a little bit about the conditions that do help certifications reach beyond those, that small group, or even successfully reach some smallholders that it might not otherwise. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it, it differs per sector, right? So I, rec I, re I recognize Jan's figure, but in cocoa and tea, uh, the sectors where I do most work, uh, it's a bit different, fortunately. Uh, but still, uh, if, you, if you look at the types of support and interventions that people get, uh, generally the better performing farmers are more easy to support to improve. And that's the, for a business case for a company sourcing uh, cocoa or tea. Uh, it's the easy way to improve in sustainability efforts, right? So even and even if you see large numbers of smallholders in cocoa and tea um, uh, certified, still there's a lot of uh, farmers who are who are well not certified because it's simply too tricky and it's 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 basically there's a cost aspect to it, uh, which also makes sense, right? Because a lot of the companies also need to spend money uh, for all kinds of certification, uh, the audits, etc. So it, there's a there's a sort of cost benefit aspect to that. One of the things what I know in terms of living income is that standards are now integrating living income standards uh, or requirements in their standards. They're not. Uh, so, such as Rainforest Alliance and Fair Trade, for instance, they're not, uh, how do you say that, compulsory yet, uh, but at least they sort of inspire people to think about living income uh, and to uh, create better conditions. The only thing with uh, certification is um, that the structural, really the structural factors such as price, they're, they're not influencing price, they add a premium. Uh, sometimes the premium is nice, sometimes it's very limited. Um, and the same for farm size. So, uh, but that in the other side, what we see also happening is they're really active in discussions like these uh, and influencing sort of the policy debate also looking uh, from their experience. The only thing is in sort of a direct translation of uh, the standards into farm practice, that's an altogether different matter, right? So these standards are implemented at farm level. So for instance, uh, for instance uh, one farmer needs to adhere to certain standards. While some of the elements that need to be covered, for instance, are landscape level forest protection, for instance. So it's a different sort of perspective. So that's, uh, that's and that's very challenging to address from, from the sort of standard perspective with the system they are in already. Uh, that said, uh, Rainforest Alliance, I know, and Fair Trade are really working on to see whether how they can integrate sort of this bigger picture and how can they, uh, Im Im well, influence the discussions also based on their experience because they're just seeing the same, right? And they're also hiring us to do studies to get insights into how how sort of the conditions could improve. Um, so I would say that's a, that's a definite plus uh, in terms of uh, their role. Um, what I see is really um, often sort of a lack of uh, government participation of the original sort of producing country governments, where government is, and obviously there's a lot of challenges, there's budgets, there's uh, ideas, etc. Et uh, but what my, uh, well, hope is really that governments and NGOs and standards and, and companies and, and the farmers themselves can get together um, to find a way how to move forward. And that's not an easy, uh, that's an easy fix, but I think that's required for a lot of the sectors we're talking about. Thank, Thank you. you.
Kevin, I'm curious Maybe if you oh, just yeah. to quickly add to that. I think that's I mean the whole what you just said, Yuka, especially working on landscape level, I think that's just so so important, right? I mean, otherwise you have single farms which have great uh, um, practices and, and and preserving the environment but in the end you, you really look at have to look at the bigger pictures but then again it's also the big challenge how to how can you bring together uh, companies governments it's it's a lot of effort to to bring all these different entities together kevin did you want to you are kevin yeah from your perspective as a company that's Kind of doing both you're looking at in a way the landscape approach for your at, through beef corp and then also really drilling into your sourcing and trying to improve if you want to add yeah i mean it's really interesting to see, listening to the challenges that, that jan and yuka are, are calling out and those are for huge commodities like coffee and cocoa and tea Whereas, you know, it, we're working with Ayurvedic herbs and we're already a subset of, of Ayurvedic herbs by being certified organic. And so, and we're a relatively small company. So, so the volumes that we're talking about are, you know, with, with some really popular things, it might be, we're dealing with tons, like with ashwagandha or turmeric or something like that. But, you know, we're using, you know, close to 80 different botanicals. And sometimes we're only talking about a couple thousand kilos and in some cases hundreds of kilos and so um it, it's just like instead of dealing with one thing like coffee it's 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 broader and so in, in some ways that feels really daunting um but i'm also um you know inspired by the interest in the herbal industry just the fact that there's hundreds of people on on this call today and, and and wanting to figure this out and maybe that there'll be a strength in in the in the smallness uh, and being able to 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 develop um relationships where, where this can work um so but yeah it, i mean obviously it's, it's a big challenge um and there's there's a lot of work to do There's a question here, and I won't be able to get to them all, but um, Rachel Weiner from Meridian asks, what do you think of the role of government should be in setting and regulating standards for social and environmental equity? How do we get to a global standard? And again, another surprising thing to me is the numbers on the business of auditing, you know, that certification and private certifications, and it has become its own little business. And so the proliferation of standards does not seem like necessarily a good thing. So I'm curious how you all think of that, this, the role of governments. Who wants to jump in on that? You can, can I mention, uh, yeah. Uh, interestingly in cocoa, this is happening. So there's an, uh, a cocoa standard uh, for West Africa, uh, which is actually, it's not as much live as it could be. Um, but these companies are, they have policies in place, generally, the, 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 well, sometimes the implementation sometimes could be better, but they have been developing different policies uh, also around adding a premium for living income, so the living income differential, um, where origin country governments actually take the, I would say the lead or an important role in thinking about how they can improve sustainability from their own sort of perspective, instead of it being uh, sort of put on top of them from sort of consumer country uh, governments even. There's a lot of discussion on regulation of, of sustainability from the EU government perspective and doing uh, human rights due diligence, for instance. Uh, so in that aspect, we see movement, that especially in West Africa, in cocoa. Uh, and I think it's really important so that they sort of create their own um, environment for, for driving this. Um, obviously, it's a question whether this is on, on top of their priority list, because there's a lot of other priorities. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a NEN standard for sustainable cocoa, so which is uh, developed by sort of a global sort of community of stakeholders. Uh, so in cocoa, these things are happening. Yeah, maybe a few words from, from, from my end. I mean, you got mentioned that. I mean, there's a European Union law coming up we've got a german law uh, in the in the preparation so we are, we are getting prepared for that and i think i think it's in the end we we see it positive um it is it is a good movement because i mean we've been working on sustainability all the time we've been investing into sustainability so i think if everybody um plays to the same rules 
um, yeah, you have improvement on the uh, on the field, uh, and you have also a living playing field between the different companies because then everybody is forced to invest into sustainability. And um, yeah, I mean, we've been doing that anyway, but uh, we also see obviously other companies who don't invest that much, and uh, it's kind of in that sense potentially not a fair competition, right? I mean, if, if we invest so much and uh, and others just don't and. So in, in general, we see that development um, positively, but it is still, obviously, we also have to discuss a lot of, 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 the, of the nitty gritty stuff with the, uh, with the government. Um, yeah, so just a few thoughts about that. Yeah, and, and from my perspective, I think that we would definitely welcome government guidance, uh, you know, especially in the area of of uh, raising living standards and setting living wages and making that really clear. Um, we also recognize that, you know, we're dealing with lots of different countries, lots of different governments, and um, can't always wait for that, right? Uh, in fact, we're, we're, we're not talking about waiting, we're, we're looking at taking action individually and into what Jan just said, to the extent that the industry as a whole can put perhaps set industry, industry standards um, so that we are kind of leveling the playing field and agreeing that like, hey, this, this, these are the wages that we're aiming to, um, to set and, and, and agree to um, could, could be super helpful in the meantime. Um, I want to, thank you. I want to have a chance to share Lawrence Phillips question. It's long, but I'm going to read it. Uh, have, I have always been concerned about fair trade certification in relation to the farmers themselves. What activity or input does he, she have to make to qualify for the bonus? I've seen so many fair trade villages next to non-fair trade villages just because the organizers drew a line down the middle. This is very unfair and leads to tension and is very different from organic certification where the farmer needs to make a so special effort and procedures to gain the reward of better prices. I'm not sure who of you wants to address that. Yeah, maybe just a quick comment to it. Um, I mean, in general, and that also Yuko mentioned that before, it's much easier to reach organized farmers. Uh, and an organized farmer in a cooperative uh, can be certified fair trade. Uh, they can be also cert certified organic, so that they can get into the system of being certified. I think the, the, the most difficult is, is to reach those individual farmers uh, who are not a part of any structure. So I think they're uh, and, and this is exactly from my point of view, where a lot of the investment of governments and, and potentially also uh, companies has to go to, to, to look at these farmers who, who don't have that structure, who don't have that access to, to any certification. Um, and yeah, I mean, fair trade and uh, uh, yeah, you, you need a certain structure in order to have an internal uh, um, auditing system and so on and so on more structural thing than than kind of saying for me at least organic or fair trade are, are, are very different there you or kevin do you want to add to that yeah i think it's just a it's also business reality and this this is the the um, the crux of a lot of things right so it mm -hmm. it costs more to small to certify a lot of smallholder farmers who produce very little than to cost to certify a few farmers who produce uh, relatively large volumes because for each farmer to be certified, there's a process. Um, so there's definitely a link with investment. So if there's, uh, the, and, and sort of the whole supply chain uh, dynamics. And I saw also uh, someone mentioning, well, if the prices go up, consumers will complain. So it's the balancing act where a lot of the companies are in. Uh, in all sides and, and the farmers themselves. So it's a reality in the field that indeed some villages are not certified or not in programs, but even within vill villages, we see huge differences in people being in part of programs and others who aren't. And that's what we try to at least uh, showcase because a lot of people assume that everyone's included and that's all very fair system uh, development support, but it, it isn't. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's from a cost perspective, basically. It's not that people intend to do this sort of consciously, it's just the reality of the business case. We've come to the end of the hour. Kevin, did you wanna? Just, oh, just, just real quick, what mm -hmm. I would say is that, that I, I think it's a great question. 
And in a sense, it's just acknowledging where we are and, and, and that we're very early on in the process. And so, okay, so maybe we've reached some of the larger scale farms, but, but like we know that there's still a significant or a huge amount of work um, still to do. Thank you all. And we could clearly continue in this conversation. What I really appreciate is how you've laid out the framework of sort of the landscape of the issues and the things to take into account and also really the point that it's a journey and to it's not a black and white you've achieved it or not and so I appreciate the tools that you've shared and the idea um, Kevin also of this industry setting standard we can continue that conversation and that's the idea of these toolkit webinars the next one will be really looking at the trade relationship between producers and and traders and are, to bring in voices of those producer companies because that's a structural issue that really needs to be looked at as all of you have made clear. Thank you all for joining and for the questions I will share the questions we couldn't answer with the speakers and we'll figure out how to respond to those. And do any of you have a closing last word you want to share? Thank you. Just yeah, thank thanks. you and have a good day, afternoon, evening. Yeah, thanks everybody. Appreciate all the interest. It's great. Yeah. It's great. great. Same. Thank you all have for a good your, day. Yeah. Thank you all for your work and your support. So I will share the screen. And again, I want to oh sorry. Um, thank everyone who's joined and also to thank the underwriters for the sustainable herbs program that have made it possible again for us to have these webinars. And you can find out all of that information on our website. Thank you again. <laughs>